plastic bag for an hour hasn't really gone over. Um, but it's coming back. I'm starting to do some programs, just lower numbers right now. And uh, so what we'd like to do this evening is use Stellarium, which is an online version of the sky. And, and we're going to show you, I'm going to show you some constellations and some, tell you some stories about stars and things, but we're going to take a kind of a deeper dive. If any of you were with us last month when we did this, we stuck mainly to constellations and stars and things you can see outdoors by just walking out, looking up. We're going to use that as our backbone tonight, but we're going to dive a little deeper and I'm going to zoom in on a few things that you'd see if you had a small backyard telescope, some things you could see with a pair of binoculars and uh, take a deeper look into the sky. So uh, rather than sitting here talking about it, I'm going to uh, jump right in and we'll get started. So let me share screen. One second, I'm going to go right to Stellarium and we'll get it full screen. I'm going to close. Can you all see that? I hope so. If as I go through this this evening, and if you have any questions, if something doesn't make sense to you, unmute and say, hey, John, you are out of your mind. What does that mean? I don't see that or whatever. <laughs> don't don't hesitate to interrupt me. I don't mind being interrupted at all. Um, if something really, if you have a question, you want to add something, uh, speak right up. Just let me just let me know. Interrupt. You can put something in the chat if you want to. Amanda's going to monitor that. I kind of ignore the chat as I go, but if it's really important, Amanda promised me she'd interrupt. So you can see this is the sky tonight. Uh, probably about uh, 15 to 20 minutes ago or half an hour ago, just before sunset. I always like to start with the sun going down in the western sky. Now, a month ago, we did this and the sun set right over by this little building right here. Look where it is now. If we speed up time, oh, and uh, we'll see it's each night now when it sets, it sets a little closer to the west. The days are getting longer, and that means the sun's moving across the sky at a higher and higher, higher angle. So each night it sets a little further towards the west. It'll set exactly in the west on the vernal equinox, which is on March 20th, I believe, this year. So let's speed up time a little bit and let that sun go down. And you can see just in a month's time, it's gone from setting over here to setting over here. In another month, we're going to be pretty close to the equinox. So the days are getting longer, if you haven't noticed. So there goes the sun. And as the sun goes down, we're going to get some stars coming out. Now, a month ago, we could see Jupiter and Saturn. And Jupiter is still between the sun and the darkness here, but it's lost in that glow. And so you're not going to see Jupiter if you get outside right now. As a matter of fact, in the evening sky, you're not going to see any stars, uh, any planets at all. So we're going to stop here. This is about 6.30. Uh, let's go just a little bit. Let's go to about eight o'clock. I'm going to go a little later. I don't want to go too fast here. Let's go to seven right there. This is seven o'clock tonight. And uh, that just gets rid of that sky glow. And we're going to begin our tour of the sky tonight by moving to the northern sky. I always like to start these things with things people are familiar with. And one of the most common things you're going to see in the sky that most people can identify is the Big Dipper. It's actually in the northeastern sky right now, standing up by the handle. So if you look carefully, you might already see it. It starts right here. It goes up to the star, over to this one and this one. That's the handle of the Big Dipper. And then these four stars right here mark the pot or the bowl. To me, it looks like a pot you cook with on the stove. Now, technically, the Big Dipper is part of a much larger group of stars called Ursa Major, the Great Bear. To see it as a bear, the handle becomes the bear's tail, the Dipper, and all the way up to here. I usually draw a line between these two stars and then a line here. This is the bear's long, skinny body with the nose out in front and a couple of front legs coming down here and a couple in the back. One thing you're going to find, and some of you may have heard this before, is that if you find and two or three different apps to learn constellations for your phone or your laptop or your tablet or whatever, or you go and buy a couple of the old fashioned things called books on constellations and you look up the Big Dipper in them all or look up Ursa Major, the Great Bear, they'll all use the same stars, but they'll draw the pictures slightly differently. They'll connect the dots differently. And I'm gonna show you the way I connect the dots and then we'll also see how this program does, which is always a little differently than the way I would do it. They didn't ask me when they put it together. But of course, the common thing you see is some beautiful picture like this of some ghostly bear or ghostly whatever the constellation may be. 
And those are kind of fun to help visualize it, perhaps, though, when you go outdoors and look at the sky, you're never going to see a big ghostly bear floating there in the sky. So it, I, I like them artistically, but I don't think they necessarily help you learn constellations if that's what you're really hunting for. You got to imagine more of a connected dot type of creature there. So the Big Dipper is just these three stars and these four right here. That's the pot. And we have to add all those other stars to get Ursa Major, the Great Bear. Now, one of the interesting things about stars is that almost half the stars you see in the night sky are actually more than one star. They look like one star to our eyes because they're so far away and they're so relatively close together that our eyes see them as a single star. But a telescope will see them as perhaps two stars, sometimes three stars. You know how the sun has a bunch of planets going around it. Many stars, instead of having planets, will have another star. If they're the same size, they orbit each other, kind of like two people dancing. If one's big and one's small, the little one tends to go around the big one, like a dad dancing with his five-year-old daughter or something. So it's, it's all about mass and how they, they orbit that way. A good example of that is the middle star in the Big Dipper's handle right here. Now, if you look at it, look very carefully, you might notice right now that you can see two stars. Look very carefully. Can you see two? There's a bright one on the right and a dimmer one on the left. Now, in ancient times, that was often used to test the acuity of your eyes because it was known that that was really two stars. The interesting thing is that if you go in with a pair of binoculars and look, you can clearly see with binoculars that there are two stars. And people often notice this third one making a little triangle here. The bright star's name is Mizar. The second one is Alcor. And this third one is called Ludwig's star. It was named after King Ludwig of Germany. And uh, because when it was first found, they thought it was a planet. It was right after Uranus had been discovered by William Herschel in 1781. And so people all, all over Europe and North America were hunting for more planets. And someone thought this was a planet. They thought they saw it moved. You know, there's a lot of wishful thinking out there. And so they named it after King Ludwig because Uranus was originally named George for King George of England, which didn't go over so well. That's why we no longer call it George, but uh, that's another story. So we have these three stars. The interesting thing is if you have a telescope and you won't see this with binoculars, but it doesn't take much of a telescope. But if you zoom in closer on Mizar, the brightest one of them, look what happens. It turns into two. So this is Mizar A and Mizar B. So they're orbiting each other. So we find that that one star in the middle of the Big Dipper's handle is really one, two, three, four stars. Scientists though use things called spectrographs where you take the light of a star and you put it, rather than looking at it with an eyepiece through a telescope, you take the eyepiece out and you put a prism there and you get the spectrum, which is like the rainbow of the light of the star. And when we do that, we find these little black lines through it called absorption lines, which are caused by what the star is made of. And so it tells us what stars are made of, which is pretty cool. We could go into that, but we could spend the whole hour talking about that. And we can also tell how they move because those lines shift depending whether the star is coming at you or going away from you. And when they look at the spectrum of this star, they find there's actually a double spectrum there, one coming towards us and one going away. It's a double star. When they look at this one, this one is a double star. So Mizar is actually Mizar A, one and two, Mizar B, one and two. That's actually four stars. And when you look at Alcor, this one over here, this one's a double star. So when you look at these stars, I wanna stop that motion right there. When you go outdoors and you look at that Big Dipper, let's put the lines on it again, and look at the middle star in the handle, what you should realize is that's not one star. It's not like two, like you might see, or three, like it would appear in binoculars, or four, like you'd see with a small telescope. It's actually seven stars. And they are all believed to be gravitationally bound to each other, perhaps. There's a little question about Ludwig's star. It may just be lined up with the other ones. But that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Now, if you do have a telescope, if you look right above the handle. See how the, this part of the handle here? Imagine you make a nice little triangle right here and you zoom in right about in this spot right here. What you're going to find in there, that was pretty close, is a galaxy. 
It's called the Pinwheel Galaxy, and it's very beautiful. You won't see all this structure unless you have a decent, like, eight or 10 inch telescope. Uh, you can see this with binoculars. It'll look like a fuzzy smudge. You have to be in a really dark location. Now, luckily, if you're in the Rangeley area, you generally have a pretty dark location up there. And if you get a really clear night, search right above that part of the Big Dipper and see if you can a little smudge of light. And you'll be looking at the Pinwheel Galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy, just like our Milky Way is. If you could fly high above the Milky Way and look back down at it, it would look just about like this. The only difference is this one's about twice as big as the Milky Way. Galaxies come in different sizes, and this is a fairly large one, but it's a really beautiful one. And what I want you to notice is see all the little pink spots in here. Those are clouds of hydrogen gas called nebulae. Each one's a nebula, and, and it's where stars are being born. So we've had a lot of star formation going on in this galaxy. We're going to see some of these nebulae in our own galaxy before we're done tonight. But when we look at this galaxy, you can see there's lots of them scattered all through. Some galaxies don't have that but the pinwheel does. So it's a, one of my favorites to explore. And you can see, if you look at the Big Dipper, it makes a nice little perfect triangle right above to find that pinwheel galaxy. You've got to be in a dark spot to see it. Now, you notice that we're looking face down at it. So let's find one that you're looking at edgewise. Come to the bottom of the pot right over here, and you're going to take your telescope and look, oops, right about in here. And let's... Uh, Lock in on that spot and we'll zoom in. And you see that little line right there? It looks like a star that's like a little dash instead of a dot. Well, that's called M108. Cool name, huh? Well, the pinwheel is um, M101. M stands for Messier. Charles Messier was a comet hunter. He really didn't care about galaxies or nebulas. People didn't really know what they were back then. He was hunting for comets, which slowly orbit the sun. And so he found that these smudges in the sky looked a lot like comets. And he was cataloging the ones that don't move because comets orbit the sun, they move. And so he wanted to know which ones weren't comets so he wouldn't spend time like watching them, see if they were moving. So he started cataloging them. So this is number 108. The pinwheel is number 101. And they're just listed in the order that he found them and, and cataloged them. So this is another spiral galaxy, but you can see here we're looking edge on. So think these spirals are round, kind of like a Frisbee or a plate, but they're kind of flat like a Frisbee or a plate too. If you could fly up above it and look down from here, it'd look a lot like that spiral galaxy we just looked at in uh, the pinwheel galaxy. This one, I believe, um, oh, I can't quite see what it, I think they call it the surfboard galaxy. Not a bad name. Now, there's something else right beside it, just below here. Do you see this little bluish dot? This is M97, the Owl Nebula. Now, the nebulas we saw in that galaxy were all pink, and this one's blue. Remember I said the pink ones are clouds of hydrogen, where, which, where the star formation going on, new, that hydrogen is collapsing on itself, forming new stars. The ultraviolet light from the stars excites the gases and makes them glow with that pink light. That's not what's happening with this nebula. This is what's called a planetary nebula because those early planet hunters noticed these were round, just like planets. Planets tend to look like disks versus dots, like stars are always dots, no matter how much you magnify them because they're so far away. Well, this has a disk to it, you can see. And uh, they thought they might be planets and they actually have nothing to do with planets. These are dead stars. When our sun dies, it's going to create something that looks pretty much just like this. This is what, what medi how medium stars, medium sized stars die. When they run out of fuel, they, they go through this swelling up, like the sun will swallow up, swell up and swallow Mercury and Venus and pretty come close to swallowing up the Earth. And then it's when it uses all the fuel inside, all the hydrogen and helium gets fused together. Uh, there's not enough weight to the sun to make carbon, which has been creating in the core. It won't make that fuse into anything else, so it collapses on itself. And then a shell of hydrogen that's still outside this core of helium and carbon starts fusing, and it pushes the outer layers away. Not in a giant explosion, just in a general push, and the outer layers of the star will just go floating away into space. That's what this is right here. And it's called the Owl Nebula because, I guess, if you looked at it, especially from this angle here, would think of this as the bottom on this side, we got the two big owl eyes here. Um, I guess that's one way you could look at it. 
So we have both those things right there under the pot of the Big Dipper, kind of hiding there. You do need a telescope to see both of those, just like the galaxy, but they're, they're actually not hard to find if you've got a decent telescope because they've got good markers right beside this star. Well, that's in the Big Dipper. Now, once you find the Big Dipper, you might want to go up and find a Little Dipper. To do that, we follow the back two stars, the Big Dipper's pot, draw a line up, and they're going to point you roughly to this star right here. And that star, believe it or not, that's probably the most famous star in the entire night sky. That's the North Star. Now, it doesn't look all that bright, does it? There are at least 45 other stars brighter than the North Star. Um, it's never been the brightest star. It's not famous for brightness. It's famous because of where it is. Do you see how it's right above the North? It's always directly above the Earth's North Pole. As a matter of fact, if you went to the North Pole, you'd have to look right straight above your head to see it. So for us, if you walk towards the Big Dipper, you'll always be walking North. Over the course of the evening, as the Earth rotates, the stars rise and set like the sun. They rise in the east and they set in the west. Well, if you look in the north, they draw circles around the North Star. This star is the only star that essentially doesn't move. It actually makes a very little tiny circle, but nothing you'll notice with your eyes. And it marks the end of the handle of the very faint Little Dipper. The handle bends like this, and this little square is the pot. So you can see here's the Big Dipper, and here's the Little Dipper, which to me looks like a ladle that you're going to scoop the soup out of the Big Dipper with. Officially, like the Big Dipper is the Great Bear, Ursa Major, the Little Dipper is the Little Bear, Ursa Minor. And we don't add any stars to it. You just got to use your imagination for that one. Well, go from the Big Dipper, past Polaris, and over just to the east, uh, just to the west of there, excuse me, you're going to see this faint band of lights in the sky. It's coming from the northwest up across the sky here. And that's our galaxy. That's the Milky Way. Now, you can see how it looks kind of fuzzy here and kind of faint. It is fainter in the wintertime than it is in the summer and the fall. In the summer and the fall, we're looking in towards the very center of the, of the galaxy. A lot more stars in the center. It's a lot brighter, a lot more structure in there. In the wintertime, you're kind of looking out away from the center. Because we're about, if you drew a line from the center of the pinwheel galaxy to the outer edge, uh, the sun and the earth would be about halfway along that line. So imagine us looking towards the center. That would be what you see in the summer and the fall. Looking to, towards the outer edge is what you see in the winter, in the early spring, like what we're seeing right now. And that's why this is fainter. Now, the sky is a typical sky you'd have on most evenings. But if you're in a really dark spot, like you are in Rangeley, much better, I'm in Waterville. And in Waterville, we've got a little bit of light pollution going on here. And this is probably a little bit better than I'd see in Waterville. But it's not as good as what we would have had in Rangeley tonight if it were clear. If it were clear and you're in a nice dark spot without light pollution, it's good. this is a plug for turning off those lights when you don't need them and shining them down and not up. Uh, the sky won't look like this. Let's shut off those lines. The sky might look more like this. Wow, it's a lot more stars, isn't it? And uh, if you're in a dark spot, you get to see a lot more stars. And so this is what you might actually find on a good clear night in the Rangeley Lakes area uh, when there's no moon in the sky. Whereas if you're down here in Waterville or Port Greater Portland or Augusta or Water or some Bangor or something, then the sky is going to look more like this. So let's, let's stay in range because where you guys are. I meant to do that earlier. Now, so we see the, our Milky Way here. Now, all these stars over here and all these stars over here, they're in the Milky Way too. It's just, this is like looking into the thickness of the galaxy. Remember that we're, if you go halfway out along that line from the center to the outer edge, that's where the sun is. But we're also halfway through the thickness from top to bottom. So if you look over here, it's like looking out the top. If you look over here, it's like looking out the bottom, there's a few stars above us and a few below us, but a lot more edge on. Now, there is one spot of light that you can see with your eyes alone that's not part of the Milky Way, and you can see it tonight. It's in this view right here. It's this little smudge of light you see just outside the Milky Way. That's the Andromeda Galaxy. That's the closest galaxy to us. Pinwheel Galaxy is really, really far away. Let me see what 
if I can see where to, how far away that was. I had it written down here somewhere. Uh, the pinwheel galaxy is, uh, where did I put that? Oh yeah, the pinwheel galaxy is 25 million light years away. So it takes the light from the pinwheel galaxy, that, that nice spiral we saw above the Big Dipper's handle, 25 million years to get to your eyes. This galaxy is only 2.5 million. That's 10 times closer. And with your eyes alone, you can see that little smudge of light. That smudge of light is the farthest thing you can see without a telescope. Now, clearly with a telescope, you can see further away. We just did a couple of minutes ago, those two galaxies. But with just your eyes, you can see this. Now, of course, if you do have a telescope, you'll see it better. With a pair of binoculars, it might look oh, maybe about like that. You'll see that smudge to it. With a small backyard telescope, it'll look kind of like this. Let's get that square out of the way. So you'll see that there's kind of an oval smudge to it. Now, you have to get used to the fact that with a telescope, almost everything looks like a smudge. Some things are round smudges, some things are just blobby smudges, and some have oval shapes. The old ones tend to be more galactic items. The cool thing is if you have a bigger telescope, you get more definition, you can see more structure. Or even with a smaller telescope, if you can hook up a camera and take a picture, you get to see it better too. With a small, like eight inch telescope and a camera attached, the Andromeda galaxy, which we're looking at here, might look like that. And with a bigger telescope, it'll start looking more like this too. Over time, that the, the sensor in your camera can gather that light and build up information and gather up the resolution. So it can see things our eyes can't see directly. All this information is really there. Just our eyes aren't as good as the sensor and the camera to gather that light over time. And so it really does make it something pretty beautiful to see. So you can see lots of all this, this brown stuff are dust clouds in the galaxy. This is another spiral. We're not looking exactly at John, but we're not looking face on either like we did the pinwheel. This one's probably about 40 degree angle. But you can, look, you can see how the center of galaxies are much, much brighter than the outer ledges, edges. That's why our Milky Way is brighter in the summertime, in the fall, than it is this time of year. Because in the summer, we're looking towards that bright center of our own galaxy. So that's the Andromeda galaxy. One of the most beautiful things you can see in the sky. It's just spectacular. But remember, this is the way it's going to look photographically or through a big telescope. Your eyes is going to be more of... Oops more of a smudge like that. Now, come back in the Milky Way, and there's a nice little zigzag here in the Milky Way. I'm going to put some lines up because it'll stand out a little better when we have this dense star field. Um, let's click on that star. This is a constellation called Cassiopeia, the queen. Now, Cassiopeia was the queen of Ethiopia, and she was incredibly beautiful, and she knew it, and she was a very vain, and she's almost always pictured sitting on a throne admiring herself in a mirror. Now, how you make a group of stars that makes a zigzag or a little W in the sky look like a woman on a throne, uh, maybe your imagination is better than mine. I find when I teach kids this, we kind of ditch the throne idea and say it looks like something the queen might wear. I think it looks like a three-pointed crown. You come down and up and down and up, and there's the base where lovely Queen Cassiopeia would put her head. So that's right in the Milky Way, right between Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy. And remember over here, we have the Little Dipper. And then over a little further, of course, we have the Big Dipper, Ursa Major. Now, once you find Andromeda, go up that Milky Way. And just above it, you're going to see a little tight bunch of stars right in here. Let's shut those lines off because they're distracting. At least they are to me. And you'll see that with your eyes right there. And we're going to zoom in. If you have a pair of binoculars, you'll realize that there are real clumps of stars there, two clumps to be exact. It's called the double star cluster. Now, remember I said all those pink patches I showed you in that first galaxy, and I said that's where stars are forming. Those are called nebulae. Well, as the, the nebula forms, it's got this big cloud of hydrogen gas. The molecules like to connect. Grab, it's just gravity wants to pull things together. All gravity is, is the desire, or it's not really desire, just the physics that objects pull together. Gravity is just pulling those atoms together. As they pull together, they clump up. As they clump, they get more gravity, and they pull more gas in. And each of these clumps will eventually turn into a star. And eventually, your typical nebula will form into maybe six or seven or 800 stars like our sun. 
So if you'd been around maybe a hundred million years ago, which sounds like a long time, but in the life of a star, that can be actually like, you know, like if your kid's nine years old, let's say, or 10 years old. So what happens is after a hundred million years, most of that gas is turned into stars, clumps of stars called open clusters. And here we happen to have two of them side by side. You often you just see one all by itself. So this is called the double star cluster, and it's really pretty. I think it's even prettier in a pair of binoculars than it is in a telescope. Because in a telescope, you can only see part of one at a time, and they're big enough in the sky. Where in binoculars, you can see them both together here. So it's a, it's a beautiful cl double cluster of stars in the sky, right in the middle of the Milky Way. And it's just above Cassiopeia the Queen. So that's all up in the northern sky. So we had the Big Dipper over here and the Little Dipper, Cassiopeia. And Cassiopeia, right above Cassiopeia, you're going to find the double star cluster. And just to the west of it, you'll find the Andromeda galaxy. And the other side of the double star cluster, what we have drawn here, and this, it lights up whenever I touch a star within a constellation or click on a star, is uh, Perseus the hero. And Perseus is, oops. Drawn, he's holding the head of Medusa in his arms because he used Medusa to kill the whale, uh, the sea monster. Another whole story, which we're going to hold off on right now. So that's where we've been in the northern sky tonight so far. So we're going to follow that Milky Way across the sky to the southeast. Come all the way down to the southern sky now. And let's uh, get rid of those lines one more time and look at a new region of the sky. See how the Milky Way is coming right down to the southeast here. Now, this part of the Milky Way is showing up better in this program than it will outdoors. Even in Rangeley, it doesn't quite show up as bright as it looks here. It's one of the problems with these programs. Sometimes they highlight things, that, are, but they make them look a little bit brighter, a little better than they do in real life. And that's the case with the Milky Way that goes through the southern sky right now. You can see it, and you'll see it better in Rangeley than you will here in Waterville, but not quite as good as this. Now, right underneath the Milky Way in the southern sky, we're going to center on a very famous constellation called Orion the Hunter. To see Orion, look in the southern sky, and you don't need to worry about that Milky Way. Just look in the south and look for three stars in a row. It's the only place in the sky you'll see three stars in a nice, short, straight row like that. That's Orion's belt going around this man's waist. He has a leg coming down to the star Rigel here and a leg coming down to the star named Safe. And you might notice the belt looks like it's pulled down to one side. That's because of a sword hanging from his belt right there. Above his belt, he has a body like this. this these are his two shoulders, a star named Betelgeuse and a star named Bellatrix. And above the shoulders, these three little stars mark Orion's head. He's got a very faint arm raised up like this. And he's holding a club or a stick in his hand come back down his arm and across his shoulders and his other arm comes down like this. And then this little curve of stars here is drawn of one of three things. And I've seen it drawn all three different ways in different resources, like different books or apps. You see the drawn as a shield. You can see he's got his club up and his shield like he's fighting with somebody. Or it's drawn as the skin of a lion because there's a story about him slaying a lion. And sometimes it's drawn as a bow for a bow and arrow. So let's uh, put some lines on this guy so you can all see him a little better, perhaps. And you'll notice they draw it a little differently than I do. I usually draw the club coming all the way to this star, star, which they often do. Here they use these two fainter stars. I don't usually draw a line between his feet. When you tie someone's feet together, they're going to fall down. So I don't like to do that. But that's what they do in this program, and it's okay. And there's his head. And his sword's hanging right here. Now, Orion is a great constellation, and uh, you often, whoops, often see it drawn. Here he is holding the skin of the lion. I personally like it as a shield myself, but you don't see it drawn both ways. Now, if you have your telescope handy or just your pair of binoculars, this is a great binocular object. Look in Orion's sword, and you'll notice, even with your eyes, a fuzzy spot right down in there. Now, this is another thing with the, these programs. You can see here it looks pink. Outdoors, it will not look pink unless you take a photograph of it. It'll look white. The pink color we see, like the pink we saw in that galaxy, shows up in photography really well. 
your eyes, it always look gray. You won't see that red color, unfortunately. I wish I could say you would, but you won't. The part of our eyes that sees faint light is colorblind, so you see black and white. The color is there, but it's not strong enough to affect the part of our eyes that sees color, the cones. But so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at that with our telescope or our binoculars. So we'll zoom in on it. And this is one of those nebulas I talked about. We saw them in that pinwheel galaxy a little while ago, just scattered through the galaxy. This is one in our own galaxy. It's called the Great Orion Nebula. And you see, it kind of looks like a fuzzy patch of light. That's what it might look like in a pair of binoculars. With a better telescope, you'll see some good structure that look more like this. Again, even in the telescope, you won't see the color here. The color only comes through with photography. The color is there, but our eyes can't see it. We can learn from the color though. And so if you take photographs, you can learn things you can't learn by just looking. The red is the gas that's glowing. There are young stars, because this is a cloud of hydrogen gas. It's collapsing and forming stars. And there are a lot of young stars in this bright section here. For the different exposure, you can actually see the stars in there. And uh, those young stars are giving off lots of light, a lot of ultraviolet light, which excites the, the gases around it and makes them glow. And when they glow, they glow with red light. The gases that are blue, that's hydrogen gas too, but there's not enough energy in nearby stars to make the gases glow. There's just enough energy to light them up. So the stars are just shining on them. Like when you shine a flashlight on something, it lights it up. So the blue is gas that's being lit. Question? No? No? Okay, I'll keep going. If you have a question, don't hesitate to interrupt me, though. But we can see both. Uh, the, the blue is called a reflective reflection nebula, and the red is called an emission nebula because it's, it's emitting light. And then, of course, we have the dark clouds here, too, and that's called an absorption nebula. This is gas that's not glowing, and it's not being lit up. It's actually blocking the light from stars behind it. And so it's just dark. And we can see dark absorption nebulas, blue emission nebulas, and red, uh, the blue reflection nebulas, and red emission nebulas. And the white in here is just an overexposure from the, the bright stars and things in that region. Now, this object is 40 light years across. That'd be measured from like about here to about here, the main breadth of the main nebula. 40 light years. Now, if you don't know what a light year is, it's a distance. Like an inch is a little distance and a mile is a bigger distance. A light year is a huge distance. It's the distance a beam of light will travel in one year's time. And light travels at the incredible speed of 186,000 miles per second. So in one second, a beam of light can go 186,000 miles. That's the same as going seven and a half times around the earth in one second. So if you go that fast in a straight line for one year, you're going to cover some miles that distance would be one light year. So from one side of this nebula to the other is around 40 light years. So this thing is really, really big and it's really beautiful and it's really easy to see even with uh, just a pair of binoculars because you can see it with your eyes, but you see it better with the, the binoculars or a telescope. Now, just above it is another very famous nebula, which you won't see with no matter what telescope you have, you almost always need a uh, do photography to see it. And I'm going to get the lines down because they're kind of covering it up. It's right under the leftmost or easternmost star in Orion's belt. You see there's that red color. That's an emission nebula. It's glowing because the nearby stars are exciting the molecules and making them glow. But we also have this dark absorption nebula. And it forms this shape that's called the horsehead nebula because it kind of looks like the head of a horse. It's like he's looking this way, looking up. Now, the Horsehead Nebula is something I've always wanted to see, and I've looked for it many, many times, and I have never seen it with my telescope. I pointed my camera at this spot and taking exposures, even with a, just my camera lens, like a 400 millimeter lens, and voila, there it is. It shows up pretty, pretty well. The camera can capture this, whereas my eye can't see it at all. And I think it's one of the most beautiful things to see in the sky. Unfortunately, you can't really see it unless you take a picture of it. Well, those are both in Orion. And Orion's a pretty amazing part of I to explore. Now, Orion, the hunter, um, is not standing in the sky by himself. He has his two faithful companions, Canis Major and Canis Minor. That means the big dog and the little dog. 
So let's find the big dog first. Draw a line down through Orion's belt and it'll point you to the bright star, Sirius. Now Sirius, this star right here, is the brightest star in the entire night sky. Now you might occasionally see something brighter. Like if you saw Jupiter earlier this winter, Jupiter's much brighter than Sirius, but Jupiter's not a star, it's a planet. Venus is brighter than Sirius too. So, but those are all both planets. The only star brighter than Sirius in our sky is the sun, and you don't see the sun out at night. When the sun comes out, it turns it into daytime. So Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky, and it marks the nose of the great dog. So I draw this, this is another place where I draw it differently than they do. I use this as the dog's nose with an ear here and an ear here. So that triangle right there is the dog's head and he's looking right at us. The dog has a body like this, uh, these oval stars right here. Front leg here, the front leg there. Come down his belly, there's a back leg and another back leg and then some faint stars for a tail. Now they draw him serious as the dog's collar. And then he comes up and this triangle is his head with his nose out in front. You'll see it drawn both ways. And that looks pretty good too. I just like, I've always drawn the little triangle because I like it being his nose. But he's got the body and his legs here and his back legs and his tail coming off here. That's Canis Major. Now, right in the middle of Canis Major, there's a little fuzzy spot right there. I like to think of it as the dog's heart, but it's another open cluster. Remember we saw the double star cluster by, by Cassiopeia? This one is called uh, the Little Beehive. And it's right here. And it's just, it's a smaller one. It's actually not smaller. It's just a lot farther away. Uh, I'm not sure what the distance is off my head, but it's one you can see pretty easily with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. And it's right in the body of Canis Major. Now there's a couple of others right beside it here too, which I think are really cool. Go from Sirius past the dog's head, no matter how you draw him. And right over in here, where are they? that one right there? Yeah, that's one right there. This one's M46. Remember Messier? This is 46. Another open cluster. But the one I really like is M47. This one right down here. Because this is an open cluster. Remember, open clusters form from nebulas, so they are young stars generally. But so this is an open cluster of young stars. When I say young, they might be uh, anywhere from uh, 20 to 100 million years old. That's kind of like being a grade school kid or maybe a middle school kid. So these are, the stars go pretty young. But you see that yellow circle there. Remember the Owl Nebula where a star died? This is a star that died too. It's not part of the cluster. It's just between the cluster and us. You know, space is three-dimensional. It looks like it's buried right in that cluster, but it's actually floating in space between the cluster and us. So that's a, a planetary nebula from an older star that had died, a star that was very much like our sun. This little line here in the distance is a distant galaxy, which when you're looking with your own eyes through your own telescope, you can see this planetary, you can see this cluster. I have never seen this little galaxy. It's there, but you need a bigger telescope to see that. So we find two nice little open clusters of star right to the to the east uh, to the east of Canis Major, the big dog, and one right in his body, right there. So we found a couple clusters there. That's the big dog. Go right above the big dog, and we find Canis Minor, the little dog. So go from Sirius past the dog's head and go to the next bright star, a star called Procyon. And I like to imagine that as the puppy's nose. And then you draw a straight line to Gamesha, the star right here, and that's his tail. And that's all there is to the little dog, just two stars, one at each end. Kids often refer to it as the hot dog. So we've got the big dog and the little dog. You see not all constellations are equal. Some kind of look like what they're supposed to, and some don't look anything like they're supposed to. This one, um, if you think that looks like a dog, my guess is you'd see dogs all over the sky, wouldn't you? <laughs> so that's Canis Major. Now, there is a constellation in between here, believe it or not, called Monoceros the Unicorn. If I click a star, it'll draw a bunch of lines in there. There are bright stars in Monoceros, the unicorn. It's just the stars between the big dog and the little dog. And you'll see the lines drawn any old which way. I don't know how you make them into a unicorn. They always draw a picture of a unicorn in there. But I don't think you can really connect the dots to make anything look like a horse or unicorn or anything else. 
at least the little dog, you can have the fun of making it be a hot dog. Well, we've got uh, Orion the hunter and the big dog and the little dog here in the sky. We're gonna go back to Orion again, because you might notice if you look at Orion, that he's got his club up and his shield. And he looks like he's fighting with someone. He's fighting the Taurus the bull. The way we went down through Orion's belt to find Canis Major and Sirius, the big dog with the bright star, Sirius, go up through his belt and you're gonna to come to a little V-shaped group of stars known as the Hyades. And this is another open cluster that's fairly close by. And it's dominated by this orange star named Aldebaran, which is the bull's eye. And the V is the bull's face, however you want to turn a V into a face. Now the bull has two long horns. One horn comes up to this star and the other one comes up to this star. So we get two really big horns here, the back of his head and his back comes back to the group of stars called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. Then he's got a couple legs, one here and one here. So they don't draw everything and they don't give the second line. I like the second line because I want them to have two front legs. And it is part of Taurus the bull. I usually draw a line up through these stars and give them a belly too. It is just the front part of a horse. They don't ever show the hind legs or a tail. So you can imagine Orion, they're fighting with Taurus the bull. He's fighting over the seven sisters. There are lots of stories about the seven sisters. Uh, one, the, the bull, Orion had fallen in love with not just one of them, but all of them wanted to marry them all. And so Theoretically, he was fighting the bull, and the bull was trying to protect the seven sisters. There are other stories about the bull kidnapping the seven ladies, and he's trying to rescue them. So you can have it any way you want, whichever story you prefer. Now, the seven sisters are a beautiful group of stars, and the best way to see the seven sisters is with binoculars. It's too big a group of stars in the sky to see with uh, with the telescope. You can point a telescope at it, but you can't see the whole thing because the telescope looks at a small part of the sky, an area about this big around, which is great for faint nebulas and, and uh, all these open clusters and things that are far away, or the planetary nebulas like the one I showed you earlier. But this is an open cluster that's pretty close by. I think it's only, uh, what? Well, let me look it up here so I don't get it wrong. Yes, yeah, it's, it's between 40 and 70 million light years away. Um, no, 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 excuse me. It's That's how old it is, 40 and 70 million years old. I misread. It's about 450 light years away. A lot closer than the Andromeda galaxy, which is two and a half million light years. So this is 440 light years from us. And uh, so it covers an area of the sky bigger than the full moon. If you put the full moon in here, it couldn't cover all these stars up in one view. It only cover a part of them. So it's pretty big. So look at this with binoculars and you'll see all these beautiful stars here. Now, all this wispiness, there's a debate whether that's the remains of the nebula that they form from. That's what they always used to say. But there's pretty good evidence now that that's actually a nebulosity that's in front of it. Just like we saw that, that uh, planetary nebula in M46 that was in front of the, the open cluster, not really part of it. They just kind of lined up. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that this nebulosity is not really part of the Pleiades because stars are all slowly moving and they're moving in one way and the gas is moving in a different way, like they're not really connected at all. And to be honest, that doesn't really show up unless you take a photograph. Get rid of the photography and it's just a beautiful group of stars. And it's much prettier than it looks in this program because it'll look like a whole bunch of diamonds in the sky all together. And there's uh, several hundred stars here. It's one of my favorite things to ponder. I go outside and I always take a look at the Pleiades if I can, because it's really a beautiful, beautiful spot, beautiful group of stars. The Hyades are interesting too. They're, that's even closer. Um, I don't know if I have a distance on the Hyades off my head here. Um, i trying to keep this stuff written down so I can keep it straight, but um, it's definitely closer than the Pleiades. And uh, they're an open cluster too. The brightest star is Aldebaran, which like we've seen, things aren't always together, even though they look together in the sky. Aldebaran's in front of them and much closer. And it's an old, old star. Aldebaran's a star that, my goodness, it's a, oh, it's, it's billions of years old. It's like, um, oh, here we go, 6.4 billion years old. That's older than our sun. 
And this is a star that's kind of an orange star or a reddish orange star. And it's a, just a little bit more massive than the sun, but it's 400 times brighter than the sun. So if you put it in the sun the same distance away, it outshines the sun by 400 times. So it's a really brilliant star. And it's red because it's old, it's swollen up and, uh, and it's getting big. So it's a lot bigger than our sun, 44 uh, solar diameters. So it, it would be massive compared to the sun. So this is an old, old dying star. Now there is a young, young dying star over in Orion, and that's the star Betelgeuse, Orion's shoulder. And this one's even a deeper red. It doesn't look that red here, but it is a very deep red star. And this is a star that was big to begin with. You know, before, when it was a young star, it was a, a really big star. And the thing with stars is that they live different lifestyles. Small stars that are like smaller than the sun will last for tens of billions, maybe 20 to 100 billion years. Older, they could be as old as the entire universe. Whereas, and as they get around the size of our sun, which is a medium-sized star, they'll last about 10 billion years, 10 to 12 billion years, which is a long time. But if you're a star that maybe you're 20 times more massive than the sun, big stars, the way to think of them, they live hard and they die young. They're fusing their hydrogen at a much more furious rate, even though they have a lot more hydrogen to burn. And uh, they can burn out in just a few million years. While the Pleiades were maybe 70 million years old, which is we considered young, Betelgeuse, believe it or not, is only 10 million years old. So this is like a really young star. But being massive meant that it lived really fast and furious and really hot when it was shining as a young star. And now it's about ready to explode. It may go supernova sometime. Now, anytime soon in the lifespan of a star means anytime in the next million years or so. Uh, two years ago, it suddenly dimmed. It became much, much dimmer than it is today. Because what scientists think it actually did was it kind of burped out some gases which were cooler and they obscured the light for a little while till they dispersed. So they got dim and stayed dim for three months, but then it went back up again. So this is a star, if something around us is going to explode and disappear, uh, this is the one that you'd want to be watching. It's between 400 and 800 light years away. So if it does explode, uh, it's not gonna hurt us in any way, but it'll be brighter than the full moon when it explodes. And that would be something amazing to see if that should happen in our lifetime. So we've seen some interesting things here in the sky. Um, I want to show you one. Now, Betelgeuse, I said, might explode. Remember the sun? I said, won't explode. Its outer layers will push its, uh, the outer layers away like and create a planetary nebula like we saw, the Owl Nebula by the Big Dipper or the one in that little cluster of stars by Sirius. Well, giant stars like Betelgeuse, they don't do that. They don't gently push things away. When Betelgeuse gets ready to go, it's going to collapse on itself. This is a star that'll be as big around as the whole orbit of Jupiter. And in a fraction of a second, it'll collapse on itself. And in that one second, it'll give off as much light as all the rest of these stars put together in that same second. So that's called a supernova explosion. That's a tremendous thing to see. In our galaxy, we've only seen three in recorded history. I think it's three. And one of them was in 1054 AD, just over... Uh, 1,050 years ago, right by inside the Horn of Taurus the Bull, right about in here. Now, the Chinese wrote, wrote about, they called it a guest star because it suddenly appeared in the sky and they said it was as bright as the moon and it was visible in the daytime. And when it was out at night, you could read by the light of this star, it was so bright. It lasted for several months and then it slowly faded away. Uh, and if you look at that spot today, you can see what's left of it. This is, uh, let's bring it in here. Oh, I'm right on it. Well, I was lucky with that one, wasn't I? This is called the Crab Nebula. Here it is right here. Let's take those stars down so you can just look at it. So this is what a star looks like when it explodes. It's not a perfect circle like many planetary nebulas. This star exploded outwards with a tremendous explosion. And a planetary nebula like the, the Owl Nebula we saw, that stuff's expanding at 1,000 miles an hour in all directions. Pretty impressive. This is expanding at over 1,000 miles per second in every direction. And if you look at pictures taken today and compare them just to pictures taken like in the 1950s and 60s, you can see how it's changed just in the last 40 to 50 years. 
So it is still expanding outwards. This is what it looks like after a thousand years. Pretty impressive. So this star is just uh, one of the most amazing things to see in the sky, if you ask me. It's called M1, the first one in Messier's catalog. It's 6,500 light years away. And uh, it exploded on the July 4th, 1054. And they said it was, it, it stayed nice and bright for 23 days and uh, during, the, during the daytime and 30 times longer than that at night. So that's, uh, and what happens when this thing explodes is that stuff's expanding outwards, but the core of the star, and this was a star that was probably at least, at least 10, if not 15 times more massive than the sun. So half of that gets thrown away, creating this, which is called a supernova remnant. But the core will shrink down, and this shrunk down until it got to be about the size of Earth. And this is, has the mass still of perhaps um, eight or 10 suns. So imagine taking 10 suns worth of material and squeezing it down until it's the size of the Earth. And then it, in, it becomes what's called a neutron star. The protons and electrons get squeezed together, so it's all neutrons. And that's what we have deep in the side here. If the star were even bigger, the core might become a black hole, though there's not a black hole in the center of this one. So that's the Crab Nebula, right between the horns of Taurus the bull. Any questions, anything I haven't shown you you'd like to see tonight that's up here? You know, we've taken a little bit deeper dive this evening, seen a few constellations and a few interesting things, at least I find them interesting, that you can find in these constellations and explored a few stars. Oops, oh, where, did, where did everyone go? What did I, hold on. Bring it back, there we go. I thought someone was texting me and it was outside oh. of the, the Don, thing. I, I do have a question. Um, yeah, go right ahead. So tonight um, we've heard a lot about looking at stars through your binoculars. Are, is there a certain rating that you want to buy for binoculars um, for night sky viewing? Yeah, well, you know, uh, when you buy binoculars, you get them like by, they, you often see like seven by fifties or seven by forties or eight by something. What those two numbers mean, the first number is the magnifying power. So if it's seven by something, you're magnifying the view seven times. If it's eight by, then you magnify it eight times. So that's what the first number means. The second number is the diameter of the lens at the end, either one of them, in millimeters. So what you, the most important thing telescopes do, and all binoculars are, are two little telescopes strapped together, one for each eyeball. So they work the same way. And we always think about telescopes as magnifying things, making things look bigger. You know, we zoom in on the Orion Nebula to make it bigger, right? These stars, though, no matter how much you magnify them in a telescope, they're not going to get any bigger. What, ha what happens, though, is if you magnify them, they actually get fainter because you're getting less light when you magnify. So with telescopes and binoculars, we're not really looking to magnify. 7x is totally fine. That's plenty of magnification. What you really want is more light. And the way you get more light is by having a bigger lens on the front. So if you go 7x50s, we'll show you more than 7x40s. Seven by 60s will show you even more. Think about your pupils. Your pupils, when you go out at night, they get bigger to let more light in, right? But I mean, how big can your pupil get? Maybe, you know, a couple of millimeters across. If you have binoculars that are seven by 50s, basically you're making it so your pupil on each eye is 50 millimeters in diameter. That's bigger around than your eyeball. You take all the light that hits those two lenses and it squeezes it down so it'll all fit inside your pupil. It makes things brighter and gives you more information which lets you see finer detail or resolution, which is not the same thing as magnification. Think about resolution on your, on your computer. If someone has a low resolution picture on Facebook and you pull it off because it's such a great picture of someone you like and you try to zoom it up, it pixelates out. Whereas if you have a higher resolution, you can zoom it up and it stays good. So by having more light, you get more resolution. So you want the bigger lens. Now you don't want it, you can get, I have a pair of binoculars that are like 90 by, by eights, let's say, or something like that. These great big lenses. The problem with the great big lenses is you need to put them on a tripod because they're heavy. And if you're standing there looking up with them, you'll start to shake because it's heavy. And when you shake and you're magnifying, it magnifies the shake. Even the little shake will show up and then it's hard to look at things. So there's a balance with there. I always suggest people get seven by fifties or 
around that range because you can hold those pretty easily. You can see a lot with them. It's amazing how much you can see with a pair of binoculars. And you, if you, you know, people call me up, especially around Christmas, they want to buy their son or daughter a telescope for Christmas. And I always ask, how much do you want to spend? And people say, oh, I want to spend $100, $150. Well, you aren't going to buy much of a telescope for $150. Yeah, you can go to your department store, Walmart or, or Target or something and buy some department store telescope, which will do little but frustrate your children. Don't buy them. Anything advertised that way, you know, 700x, you don't want 700x. That's not a good thing. Uh, it's your, they're not going to see anything good through them. They're going to get frustrated with them. Get a nice, for $150, you can get a decent pair of binoculars, though, and you can see a lot of cool stuff with them. You can also look at birds with them, you know, and you can look at the deer across the field or the moose that came out in the swamp or the sailboat, uh, you know, off uh, Mark Island, off Camden or something. And so you can use them for lots of things, but they're great for the sky as well. That's what I recommend. If you want to get, a you can get a decent telescope for your kids for three or $400 for a starter telescope. Any other questions? Does that help? That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> this whole evening has been wonderful. We've learned so much. Oh, or maybe I muted myself. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed it. I've had a great time sharing this with you. And um, I'll stop sharing here for a second and see if anyone has any questions to finish up. Oh, I put them all to sleep. Look at that, Amanda. They're just gone. <laughs> well, I hope you get out and look at the real sky. I think it's supposed to be clear tomorrow evening in the early evening uh, up there. And, uh, and I'll get outside and see if you can find some of these things. Look at the constellations. If you don't have any binoculars, if you have a pair of binoculars and you've never used them for anything but looking at birds and moose and deer, um, take them out, look at the stars too. You'll be amazed what you can see. And look at that Orion Nebula in the Pleiades, if nothing else, because they are just stunning. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. And thank you, John, for leading us. Oh, um, you're welcome. I hope that everybody can join us again uh, later in March. So yeah, we're gonna do that. it. Another one, if it's a nice night, I'm going to come up to Rangeland. We're going to do it in the real sky out there. <laughs> amazing. Fingers right? crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We've been trying that for a long time. If not, we'll be back on here and we'll find a new twist to look at it a little bit differently again. So hope to see you all again in another month. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night. everyone. Good night. Bye, Good night. Amanda. Good night, Amanda. Goodbye. See you later. Thanks for coming.